Can a TV series inadvertently foresee future events? Or is it the infinite monkey theorem that hypothesizes a chip would eventually type out the complete works of Shakespeare given infinite attempts? In the 26 seasons that South Park has been on the air, they are bound to hit a few keys that foreshadow future events. So let's delve into South Park's most startling predictions. In the episode Gluten-Free Ebola, Mr. Mackey blames everything on gluten. I'm just saying that I personally feel so f***ing amazing. Meanwhile, a nutritional advisor from the USDA conducts an information session at the community center trying to dismiss the misconceptions of gluten, especially the rumor that gluten can make your d*** fly off. Mackey dares the advisor to eat the concentrated gluten. After doing so, he dies a horrible death, and yep, his d*** flies off. <laughs> This throws South Park into an upheaval. Everyone burns food that contains gluten, even beer. The town is locked down by the USDA, quarantining Randy and Mackie at a Papa John's restaurant. Not Papa John's! I don't want to go to Papa John's! You can't make me go to Papa John's! Because they're infected with the, uh, the gluten. Turns out that it was all a misunderstanding and everything works out. In the end, no one else's dick flies off. Weirdly enough, the week the episode aired, Ebola cases were reported in the U.S. So, did South Park call it, or were they just paying attention to the news? I'm gonna side with the typing monkeys on this one. Moving on to the world of Blowbiz, in the episode Chef's Chocolate Salty Balls, the Sundance Film Festival invades South Park when Park City, Utah, becomes flooded by tourism. It's Paul Newman's plot to exploit every picturesque small town until they're all exhausted. Kinda like a, a civic vampire. This newfound glamour excites the town folk and Mr. Garrison assigns the students to attend the festival to write a paper about the films they've watched, pushing an independent coming-of-age lesbian story. Chef sells his chocolate salty balls to the LA industry types and moviegoers. The other B plot includes Mr. Hanky, Heidi Ho, who becomes ill because of their healthy excrement overloading Hanky's fragile ecosystem, the sewer. Wendy invites Stan to attend a screening. It's a movie about two cowboys who have finished eating their pudding and lack something else to do. So they get down on it. Like in Brokeback Mountain, starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Heath Ledger, released in 2005. However, the South Park episode aired seven years before. Can this be chalked up to Matt and Trey's potent imagination, or did they just synthesize cultural postmarks and invent this scenario? I'm super! Thanks for asking! Don't ask, don't tell. Speaking of celebrities, Stan's adopted Canadian brother Ike is terrified because he keeps seeing dead ones all the time in the episode Dead Celebrities. The annoying infomercial salesman Billy Mays haunts Ike with a variety of sales pitches. Among them is a cleaning agent called Chipotle Away to clean bloody underwear messes that occur after eating Chipotle. But six years later, Chipotle had to shut down restaurants in 11 states, 43 restaurants in Oregon and Washington alone because of an e E. coli outbreak. One of the possible symptoms of E. coli is, well, yeah, you guessed it, bloody diarrhea. So Chipotle away would have come in handy in 2015. A date which will live in infamy. On a more serious note, the episode Osama Bin Laden has farty pants sort of predicted Bin Laden's death a decade after it aired. Still reeling from 9-11, South Park is wrapped with fear. The children wear gas masks, paranoid of an anthrax attack. In class, Miss <laughs> instructs the children to send a dollar to the war-torn children of Afghanistan. And of course, Cartman protests. In return, the Afghani children, who are doppelgangers of the South Park kids, are obliged by tradition to send something in return. A goat. A goat that the US military personnel mistake as Stevie Nicks from Fleetwood Mac. In a goofball Looney Tunes type sequence, Cartman and Osama act out some old timey vaudevillian bits. Cartman as Bugs Bunny dressed up as a voluptuous tart. Osama is smitten by a camel. You know, all the classics. U.S. forces engage Al-Qaeda in a battle to protect Stevie Nicks so she can perform with Fleetwood Mac at the USO show later that night. Cartman and Osama are still dicking around with some old comedy bits. The end result is that his own troops shoot him, they all explode, and a U.S. soldier pops him in the head, thus fulfilling the prophecy. Or is it? Sure, it wasn't SEAL Team 6 that took him out, but instead, maybe Cliff from somewhere USA? 
Fuck it, let's attribute this one to the universe, shall we? Meanwhile, in a less war-torn part of the world, Canada on strike predicted the downfall of Canada when, at the time, no one could have entertained such an idea. I'm not your friend, buddy! I'm not your buddy, guy! Out of the blue, the students are expected to participate in Canada Appreciation Day and are forced to watch a ridiculous video presented by Stephen Aboutmanet, the president of the World Canadian Bureau. This goes over like an invisible lead balloon, because no one gives a flying f So Aboutman confronts the world governments. We want more money. Abutman's masterstroke is to demand some of that internet money. The world's governments are dumbfounded, so Abutman declares that Canada will strike. Whatever that's supposed to look like. South Park depicted the Canadian population shivering and hungry in the cold without a threat of hope. Abutman isn't a competent leader and he's the head of a fictitious, empty organization. Just like Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party of Canada. Well, in a weird turn of fate, Canada has become just that. First of all, Justin Trudeau's Bill C-18, or Canada's Online News Act, demands that big tech companies pay their fair share to Canadian news agencies if platforms like Meta want to continue to host Canadian news on their platforms. The simple solution is that big tech companies won't publish Canadian news on their sites. Bill C-18 only exists to kill opposing narratives to the Liberal Party's propaganda. In a short eight years, Canada has been downgraded in the G20 pecking order. Housing is unaffordable, homelessness is rampant, Food is unaffordable and dividing Canadians with a woke agenda. Oh, and now we have online censorship. So how f***ing cool is that, eh? So kudos to Matt and Trey. What's your take on all this? Let me know in the comments. And thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe, and I predict that I'll catch you in the next one.